So, so uh, I'm Greg Lucanville. Morris and I are both vice presidents, actually. It's my uh, honor to uh, introduce uh, uh, an event tonight that is probably one of the most unique and historic events that the Historical Society has ever put on. And I'm genuinely not only excited about it, but intrigued by where this is going tonight in terms of living history, which is something that, uh, you know, we're, we're very, we live in so much of it here in Sacramento that we take it for granted. But uh, this is a, a story that's going to be very different than has ever been told. I think you're about to find out. But before I do that, I want to uh, introduce board member Christina Richter, who is uh, doing a very dynamic job putting us into a place that this organization has never been before. She is responsible for uh, putting us into and running the Big Day of Giving program that we've put together. So, Christina, what? you're up. Thank you, Greg. It's, oh. it's great to be here this tried. evening. And hopefully, Maybe. Morris, you can mute everybody except me right now. So Big Day of Giving is on May 6th, which is a week from this Thursday. And right now we have over 700 nonprofit organizations in the Sacramento area participating. We're one of a few of the historical organizations that are participating and it's our first year. We're absolutely honored and we're thrilled. And at first we weren't quite sure how to handle it until we all put our heads together and we said, let's do what we do best which is put on great history presentations. So what I'm about to show you is our history a -thon on the big day of giving. It is a free event. The entire public is invited to just zoom in, drop in. From 10 a.m. to noon, we're gonna cover sports from two of our great board members. Marshall Garvey has written an incredible book about Sacramento's baseball history. And then of course, Greg Lukenbill, the guy who brought the Kings to Sacramento, he's gonna be talking about that entire journey and how dynamic it was and the ins and outs of it. That promises to be an incredible section of our history a thon. And then from noon to four, Bill George, our president, is going to be showing off his award winning films on the Transcontinental Railroad, um, our agricultural background, our Chinese builders of Gold Mountain. And then at three o'clock, he's gonna be presenting Gold in the American River. This isn't your typical story about gold and the discovery of gold. Bill has a very unique twist on it, which I know our audience is going to love. The rest of the afternoon from four to 8 p.m., we'll have a myriad of topics. Island in the Streams, Greg Lukenbill will be up front again, and he is phenomenal at understanding our earliest days of Sacramento and how the, the streams, i.e. the rivers, literally created where we live. And he's gonna take us through that with some incredible maps as well. At five o'clock, Dan Sebi, who we are just super honored to have on our board, Sergeant Major Dan Sebi, is, is gonna be exploring the military history influence of Sacramento from pre-World War through the present. It's gonna be fantastic. And then I'm up on the reputation of pandemics. When the Spanish flu was here, we learned about it real quickly when COVID hit, right? Well, do you know we're in our fifth pandemic in a hundred years? And I'm going to drill down into the pandemics and talk about them and maybe a little bit about how that's influenced today's decisions. And then to round it out, medical historian Dr. Bob is going to be presenting medicine and the gold rush era, which is a pretty uh, interesting rather primitive look at early medical history, but it's absolutely fascinating. We want you all to join us. Information is on our website at sachistoricalsociety.org. There's no registration. Zoom in when it's convenient. I'll also have this posted on Facebook. And if you have any questions at all, of course, just lob us a email and we'll give you all the details. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Greg Lukenbill. Thank you. Very, very nicely done, Christina. Thank you for um, doing that, uh, really for leading this effort for the Historical Society and also to to um, for your um, um, nice presentation tonight. Nicely done, very, very well done. Um, it's my honor to just take a minute to discuss one of the most interesting um, and dynamic uh, groups of people 
I've ever come across in my career in, in a story that's, that's going to dwarf that. And that is the forlorn hopes story of the desperate, literally uh, live or die efforts of 15 people to save the Donner Party stuck obviously up there on the east end of Donner Lake under 20 feet of snow who came to the recognition that they were all going to die if somebody didn't get out of there and get the word out that they were trapped up there. And so 15 of them uh, harnessed up the courage to attempt to make that trip. And that's what this story is about. But it's going to be told by an interesting group of men and women uh, that are four of the four extreme athletes that are absolutely, um, uh, ex, you know, the courage, they're all people who know what it means to hit the wall, which I'm sure is a little sampling of what it's like to be in a life or death survival moment. And having said all of that, I want to, it's my honor to, uh, it's our honor of the Historical Society on behalf of the board to have these people as presenters tonight. And I'm going to hand it over to Bob Crowley, who's going to take it from there. Great. Well, thanks, Greg. That's a very gracious introduction. And uh, um, boy, you, you've set a high bar for us to live up to. We'll do our best. But we are, we're the ones that are honored to be here. This is, we talked uh, before everybody came on tonight and uh, how huge this organization is, over 400 members. It's probably one of the most prestigious uh, historical societies in the nation. It's certainly one of the most progressive. So we're, we're thrilled to be here. And uh, we're here tonight to really talk about a few topics, but mostly about the forlorn hope. So, but before we do, let me um, see if I can get this going here. Let me introduce, uh, we're gonna introduce each other, the team members of the expedition, and then we'll talk a little bit uh, about the forlorn hope. So I wanna introduce my, my co-leader and partner, uh, Tim Tweetmeyer, the good looking guy on the left in this picture. Um, Tim is a world-class athlete. Um, those of you that may know, they're one of the most famous uh, foot races in the mountains in the world is the Western States 100 mile endurance run. Uh, it takes place every year in June up in the, from Squaw Valley to Auburn. Uh, Tim is, is uh, a 25 time finisher, the only person in the world to finish it 25 times, all under 24 hours, and he's won it five times. Um, Tim is well known around the world for his feats. He's uh, also uh, done a run from Squaw Valley to Auburn following the Miners Trail and the Pony Express Trail. Uh, and he did that in the winter. It was a winter crossing. And then he did what was called cap to cap. He invented a run from Carson City to Sacramento. And uh, again, all through the mountains and the trails, uh, he set what's known as an FKT. It's the fastest known time for the T Tahoe Rim Trail around Lake Tahoe. Uh, Tim's a passionate historian as well as an athlete, a father, lives in Auburn with his family, and I'm proud to have him as my partner. So welcome, Tim. Thanks, Bob. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce that uh, young lady standing next to me in the picture, Jen, Jennifer Hammond. And uh, Jen cut her backcountry skills uh, in the Northeast, in the White Mountains as a teenager, going out in high school programs and being out in the snow for days at a time, and then went on to lead groups of backcountry people at places like Outward Bound and uh, backcountry hiking in countries uh, like Nepal and whatnot. So she's got a great backcountry um, resume as well as then became an endurance athlete, much like Bob and I, where we got into distance running on the trails, 100 mile runs. And uh, Jen's actually uh, finished the Bear 100 mile run, which actually goes through the same Wasatch Mountains that the Donner Party traversed through in their trek across Utah. Uh, lately, Jen, as uh, you might have noticed a year ago, she was actually part of a TV show as part of the Eco Challenge Fiji. That's a 350 mile multi sport uh, team event where you're cycling, running, paddling, navigating, uh, all kinds of different uh, tricks and trades to bring all kinds of outdoor skills to bear. And uh, Jen finished that. And uh, she lives actually in Fair Oaks with her three kids between the ages of 10 and 17 and her husband. And uh, she had one unique skill that we needed on the expedition, which was a map and compass navigator. We knew that if we got really gnarly out there, all the electronics that Bob and I would carry would not do us any good. And we were gonna count on Jen to do some uh, map and compass type navigation. That's one of the skills needed on an eco challenge team. And she was an excellent navigator. So 
that skill was actually did come to bear a funny story on it. But uh, Jen, I'll turn it over to you. All right. And Tim is teasing me because uh, we had a fantastic uh, team in terms of Tim could look at any horizon and know exactly which way to go. So <laughs> we, we did not have a problem with navigation. However, um, I, I have the honor of introducing Elka, who is one of the most phenomenal women I've ever met in my life. She is an ultra runner. She is a uh, mountain backpacker. She is on every peak of California every weekend of the year. And I've made some notes so I can be sure to catch everything. She was born and raised in California. And one of her interesting attributes is she has lived at every section of the Forlorn Hope route. So as we ran along the 108 miles, she would point at the houses she had lived in or built along the way. So that's phenomenal. She is the mom of two amazing women. She holds the title of the only mother-daughter team to ever finish Western States 100. I'm hoping to have a repeat with my 17 year old when she gets of age, um, but that would be because everything Alka does, I would love to do as well. She's a real inspiration. Um, she is affectionately known as the chainsaw lady for her job as an expert sawyer in clearing all of the high Sierra trails of the large trees that fall down in the winter months. When you see a fallen tree, you text Elka the picture and she comes out with her, her chainsaw, perhaps a motorcycle and a couple helpers and she clears it. So she is the chainsaw lady um, and she has two daughters, like I said, and one fur baby. And we also love Elka for her soup making skills, her photography, <laughs> and her just all around awesome nature. She's the girl, you know, she's the woman you want to be with to share a beer and to go to the mountains with. So Elka Reamer. Thank you so much. That's a kind introduction, Jennifer. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Mr. Bob Crowley, who's been a friend of mine for several years as just not only someone who's passionate for, for trail running, but just as being passionate for history. Uh, we're in the same circle of, of running friends and he's just a great all around guy. He's not only a successful entrepreneur as managing partner of, of the Mustang Group, but he's also the president of ETRO, which is the International Trail Running Association. Um, his love for running has resulted in completing over 200 endurance events, including Western States and Hard Rock. He's a phenomenal athlete. Um, he's also completed runs exceeding 200 miles, which is beyond impressive. Um, it's been an honor of mine to know Bob and his bride, Marcy, who he's been married to for 40 years. I think she's in this meeting as well. Um, they have two sons and they're also grandparents. It's really Bob and Tim who are the brains behind this expedition. And I was fortunate enough that the three of these incredible athletes invited me to join them along on this expedition, which is really to, to honor the forlorn hope by retracing their steps. And, and by honoring them, I learned so much about this incredible heroic team of original pioneers. Cool. Well, listen, thank you, Elka. And um, so we went around the horn. And now what we'd like to do is just before we get into the uh, uh, Forlorn Hope and, and the expedition, talk a little bit about our, our team and kind of what we believe. And we are passionate about history, uh, as all I'm sure everybody on this, this call is and all of our friends. Uh, we love the outdoors as well. And so uh, we're constantly looking for innovative ways to try to put the two together. And we're always looking to for stories that inspire um, or, or discoveries that can be made. There, even though um, there's been so much work done in California and particularly in the foothills and here in Sacramento, there's still new discoveries being made every year. And we love to, to dig those up and find them. Um, we, we, we come from technology, all of us do. And so here, the, the world center of technology is in California, and so why not use technology to help leverage bringing history um, to everyone in a lot of innovative ways? And then we we love the outdoors, so we love to live history, engage in it. And so our, our slogan is really step into history and go for a hike. And so it's living history, not just uh, reading about it, nothing wrong with reading about it, but reading about it and then going out and actually trying to uh, 
to, to experience it and step on those footsteps. So uh, let's get on to the, the main feature. And, and it's really not at all about us or the expedition. It's about the forlorn hope. And um, they're at the heart of our presentation today. And I, I think the first thing uh, I wanna try to do is get a show of hands, show your hand in the screen if you're familiar with the Donner Storty party. I'm gonna presume we get almost 100%. Yep, just about 100% right there. Um, tell us, how many of you are familiar with the snowshoe party story? Okay, yeah, what, what we thought, a lot, a lot less. And it's a bit of a trick question because the snowshoe party is the forlorn hope. Uh, they were noted as the snowshoe party and it wasn't until 1879 when C.F. McClatchen wrote his preeminent book, the first book about the Donner Party, that he actually renamed them or gave them the name the Forlorn Hope and it, had, it has stuck ever since. So we'll refer to this group as the Forlorn Hope. And uh, they are, um, it's a, an amazing story. I'm gonna give you a brief synopsis and then we'll, we'll get into the details a little bit later. So um, as a background, it's, their objective, they, they were 15 people, 17 originally, but two went back right away. But 15 people that came out of the, the Donner Party group, there were 90, you know, there were 80 some people at the lake and Alder Creek. And uh, their objective was to seek help for all the people that were stranded at the lake and Alder Creek. And those of you that know that story, uh, no one knew where they were trapped or how badly they were trapped. And so, Although there were attempts by James Reed had gone ahead because he was banished to begin to get help, um, he had no idea how bad it was. So these 15 brave members, nine men, five women, and one boy, uh, left on snowshoes that were crafted by one of the members, uh, 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 Franklin Graves, the, the elder of the group. Uh, he's a Vermonter, so he knew how to uh, bend the oxbow, split them, bend them, and then use uh, leather to craft the snowshoes, and off they went with six days of provisions. They thought it would take somewhere between six to eight days to go what they thought was the 40 miles from Donner Lake to Johnson's Ranch, which is in now today's uh, Wheatland, California. So they had six days of provisions, a uh, little bit of sugar, a little bit of tobacco, some rawhide, not a lot of food, very, very little food. And the reason for that was they wanted to leave as much food behind as they possibly could for the rest of the men, women, and children that remained behind. They departed on the 16th of December, 1846. And uh, as I said, it figured they'd get to Johnson's Ranch about six to eight days later. Well, they reached Johnson's Ranch on January 17th, 1847, uh, doing the math, that's 33 days later. Um, they got lost, they got severely lost they lost their guide, Charles Stanton, first. He only lasted four days. He was exhausted and snow blinded and, and they had to leave him behind. He was uh, gracious enough to just sit by a tree and say, I'll be along, because uh, he knew uh, he didn't want to stress them out, but he knew he was going to die. And so they lost him. And then Lewis and Salvador, two Miwok guides that uh, Stanton had actually brought back over from, uh, John, uh, from uh, Sutter's Fort, they didn't know the way. They did, certainly didn't know the way going west, and they didn't know uh, the way in deep snow. And as you all know, the terrain looks much different when there's 30 feet of snow than when it's a uh, nice uh, uh, void of any snow. So the two guides uh, had no idea where they were going to go. They had no map. They had no compass and no ability to dead reckon because they were in the midst of a 100-year snowstorm. So it was cloudy, raining, or snowing the entire time. Couldn't see the moon couldn't see the sun. Uh, they, they were hit by four different severe snowstorms and uh, the entire trip that they ended up taking was almost 100 miles. Um, it, 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 there were five instances over the 33 days where they starved for two to three days at a time. For a total of 15 of the 33 days they were starving. They had no food whatsoever. Um, there were two sheer cliffs down and up out of the North Fork of the American River, which is when they got lost where they ended up. If anyone's been there, it's one of the most remote and, and, and uh, uh, death-defying places in all of the, the country, not just California. 
Their feet were macerated, blistered, and bloody. But out of the 15 that started, seven survived and ultimately made it to Johnson's Ranch, getting word uh, to uh, those that were there, sending the alarm, and ultimately um, bringing the help that was uh, dearly needed back to Donner. So that's the, that's the you know, synopsis of what the Forlorn Hope is. Um, I'm going to uh, throw it over to Tim now to talk a little bit about our expedition. He's going to give you a little background on that, and then we're going to show you a little video on how that all came together. And then we'll come back and talk a lot more about the Forlorn Hope. So Tim, let me throw it over to you. Yep. Yeah, so this is, uh, what you see there is just uh, the green line is kind of our path that we researched on the Forlorn Hope Party. As uh, was mentioned, they started out the east end of Donner Lake and uh, the emigrant route goes over Donner Pass, 7,200 feet through the Summit Meadow and what was today the Royal Gorge Cross Country Ski Area past Devil's Peak, which you'll see later on in some of the video, to the point where uh, they go down to which is what is known to, uh, back then as Yuba Bottoms, but would be similar to where Kingvale and Cisco Grove are today. And that's where Charles Stanton died. Uh, he just, Bob mentioned, sat down and said, I'll go along and just perished right there along the river. From there, it generally follows Interstate 80 uh, down to Cisco Grove off ramp and then on to the Eagle Lakes uh, off ramp where the trail turns and goes uh, kind of through a, uh, an RV park today, but through a place called Six Mile Valley. It's this beautiful little valley that parallels I-80 between, let's say, uh, Cisco Butte and Yuba Gap. So you, you, uh, these are all well-known off ramps of the freeway on Interstate 80. It's when they got just past Yuba Gap into a place called Carpenter Flat, near where Immigrant Gap is today on I-80, where they needed to turn north and go over the freeway, what would be I-80, go to the north side of the freeway and drop into the Bear Valley. At that point, the Bear Valley rolls all the way southwest into Johnson's Ranch. They had it made if they would have made that one little hop over the top, but they made a wrong turn and, as Bob mentioned, ended up in the North Fork of the American River through these places that we'll describe in part of our video, the, the Camp of Death, uh, the Sawtooth Ridge where they can see the valley in and out of the North Fork of the American River, uh, the deer hunt into the Maidu and Nissanen villages that were along the uh, Bear River and on to Johnson's Ranch, which is just on the perimeter of modern day Wheatland. So how we found this route is we started reading books, particularly started with a book called The Indifferent Stars Above written by Daniel James Brown. And we, after we read that, we started collecting all the books, the George Stewart book, Ordeal by Hunger. I think Bob and I has collected something in the vicinity of 45 different books that reference either the Donner Party, the Forlorn Hope, or both, including uh, rescue parties and, and whatnot. And from that, we went out on foot and, and researched this route, uh, going places that we really thought they went and figured out where they made their wrong turn, where we thought the camp of death was. And even places that we, they, we knew they didn't go, such as the Rawhide Mine and some of these places. If you've never been into the North Fork of the American River, it's like the miners just left last week. There is mining equipment, ore carts, stamp mills, ladders, shovels, things that you'll find as if they'd been there since 1849. And as Bob mentioned, they started December 16th, 1846. Our expedition started the exact same day, 174 years later. It was last December 16th. And we follow what we thought was the exact same path that the Forlorn Hope took, uh, the approximate 100 miles uh, from Donner Lake to Johnson's Ranch. And the first half was primarily in snow, the second half through remote trails until we got to Colfax, at which point we ended up on some roads. And what we did with this, it, this was not a reenactment. We weren't going to put our wool leggings on and, and tote our backpacks and, and wool hats. This is a tribute to these folks, because as we looked at this as four pretty seasoned endurance athletes and backcountry aficionados, we see this as one of the greatest endurance feats in American history. These folks were just your normal folks trying to take advantage of the manifest destiny and were, th were thrown into this um, kind of predicament and on their own courage and perseverance and raw uh, desire were able to save not only their families but several others back at the lake. Okay Bob? Great thanks Tim. So um, we're gonna switch uh, next to a, a little short video 
which is going to give you, a, a, you know, three minutes, a synopsis of how we arrived, you know, kind of the background to how we put the expedition together. And as, as Tim said, what, what really caught us more than just discovering the trail, and, and mind you, there, there were no forensics. This was one trail taken one time and they were lost. So unlike a lot of trails, we couldn't go out and find and dig up uh, old iron and pieces of uh, wagon trains or, or what fell off uh, the mules. But um, it, it, was, it took us seven years to repiece together what the trail was and a lot of field work. But more important than finding the trail, we found the people and, and we fell for the forlorn hope and the members and these very, as Tim said, very ordinary people that, that uh, perform this extraordinary feat. And, and let's face it, we can all use that kind of inspiration in these days. So we're gonna play a little video that gives you a, a synopsis of how we arrived at, at the actual expedition itself. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a, a, a quick synopsis of kind of how, how did we end up where we did. Um, it was not by design, uh, trust uh, Tim and I. We, we were just gonna go out and figured we'd get the map of the Forlorn Hope, go uh, do it for fun over a few days and um, uh, that would be that. Uh, little did we know it didn't exist and we were gonna have to discover it, find it and, and little did we know that was going to be hard because there, there were no forensics and very little known about them. So it's been, it's been an incredible journey for us. And I think the most rewarding thing is getting to know the Forlorn Hope as people. And, and that, that work continues. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. We've just scratched the surface. So 
we are uh, literally all in on the Forlorn Hope and, and, uh, and, and a bunch of other projects that inspired us along the way. Okay, so now we've talked in a synopsis about uh, first the Forlorn Hope and who they are, and then our expedition to honor them. Uh, now we wanna go back and, and, uh, and get into some more detail about the Forlorn Hope. And, and we thought it would be, uh, again, we try to use innovation and technology best we can to bring, bring um, uh, history to life. And so what we'd love to do is take all a hundred and some of you right now and go out into the Sierra and literally take, take steps and show you what we've seen. But obviously we can't do that given COVID and given uh, it's late in the evening and probably uh, many people are into their meals and cocktails. So instead, we're gonna take you on a video tour. So we're gonna ask you to sort of join us. Um, whoops, that's not what we want. We're gonna ask you to journey with us. So we got to go and walk in the footsteps of the Forlorn Hope. And luckily we took along a, a very gifted set of uh, camera people that documented that. And now we're gonna take you on a five minute journey with us. So just as though you're long and we're gonna stop and talk as we go. So just as if we were doing this for real in the field, uh, you know, you'd stop at the significant places like a good guide would and talk a little bit about what happened in those places. So we're gonna simulate best we can. Um, although admittedly we'd prefer to be out on foot doing it with you. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna roll this film and then it's, we're gonna stop in some places and, and we're gonna have uh, each of the team members talk a little bit about what you're seeing and what's coming up next. So hope you enjoy this. So I'm going to uh, throw this over to, I think it's, is it Tim first up? I think it's nope. me. Yep, it's yep. Jen. Jen's going to talk a little bit about, a little bit about what you just saw, but also about what's coming next and reflect on, um, you know, the why. why. Why did these 15 people do this? Yeah, so I just want to start by saying that being part of this expedition is unlike anything I've ever done in my life. We are four people who embrace uh, challenge. We love to challenge ourselves in the outdoors. It brings me alive. I've been this way since I was little. But this expedition awed me because these people weren't seeking a challenge. They had been promised an easy route to California. What they found instead was an endless, uh, an endless stream of being uh, tricked and things not working out the way they thought and bad luck. They have been told lies since the beginning. Here they are trapped for many, many weeks and they're desperate. Many, many times, three times at least, they've tried to go out with an experienced guide and been turned back by weather. So when Franklin Graves makes these snowshoes over a period of days and goes around to the different snow huts to ask who wants to be part of this, the question to us is, why would you join the Forlorn Hope? Who are you? 
which we can only we can only guess what would make someone who had already experienced uh, Hastings cut off being a lie, the salt desert being 80 miles instead of 40, the Indians being hostile instead of friendly, uh, families falling apart at the seams, murder and banishment. At this point, they are faced with being trapped here. And Franklin Graves goes from hut to hut and says, who wants to be part of an effort to save us all because we're all going to die if we don't. There is no hope at this point that James Reed is coming back. Uh, Charles Stanton has showed up and tried twice or maybe three times now to get out. He can't do it either, even though he's experienced and knows the way. Franklin Graves comes up with the game changer, the snowshoes. So they're, they know they have a game changer, snowshoes. He's looking for bravery, courage, uh, resolution, and, and he's looking for hope. So he goes about, sick people aren't included, uh, they can't come. Mothers with multiple children can't come, but fathers are available. And in that awful decision needs to be made. There's four fathers, three mothers who decide to go. Um, they have to leave anything from a one-year-old to a two-year-old to multiple ages behind them. They don't know if they're ever gonna see these kids or their parents or their siblings or their loved ones or their wives ever again. And so we ask ourselves, why would you join? You would join if you felt you were the very best hope for your family and the people you've grown to either love or be part of a clan of to survive. So you have to be so brave because people have already tried and they got turned back. The weather is unlike anything they were described in the books or journals describing the journey to California. They are living in a world of, of artificial intelligence. The, nothing that they've been told has come true yet. So you have to be so incredibly brave to do this journey. And while we were standing on the top of Donner Pass as hardcore winter athletes is when they looked back and saw those home fires burning and they had to send the first two people back and say, you won't make it, you're going to die. They send back a 10 year old and they send back a, one of the Teamsters. They at that point know they are completely responsible for the lives of every single person in that valley. That must have been a burden unlike anything that I could imagine and I'm a search and rescue person and an outward bound instructor where you have the lives of many teenagers and people on, your, on the line. I, I can't imagine the responsibility they felt to succeed at this mission. So at that moment, we're standing on the summit. It's, it, it is a moment of illumination. It's very beautiful. One of the members said they couldn't help but note that they were closer to heaven than they ever would be in their lives. It was probably awe-inspiringly beautiful. They'd never seen this landscape. But think of the fear that they had for the weather, for the terrain, for the unknowns. People promised them it was only 40 miles. People promised them they only need five days of food. That was not true. And they had been lied to before. So they had to have courage. And so we reflected on that at that point. And I really uh, was inspired by Bob and Tim's direction on this. We reflected on that. And it brought tears to my eyes to look back and realize this isn't just a beautiful place that I come to to ski. This was a choice between life and death for these people to go forward and save their loved ones. So on that note, I'll turn it to Elka, who's going to talk a little bit about what you'll see in the next uh, video segment. Yeah, so, so coming up, and, and I certainly share the same sentiment as, as Jennifer. Um, in fact, I've, of course, revisited the, the, uh, the area in which we hiked over time and have stopped at the, at the lookout above Bear Valley where they were supposed to go. And it's just really humbling to think about where they ended up going, which is on day seven, which is a day after they, they lost Charles Stanton they made a mistake in their direction and they, they began to head south at that point. Is they made their way south a major storm, one of those major storms that Bob was talking about. Um, 
came their way and, and lasted for days and basically brought their progress to a halt. And it was, it was obvious at that point because they were out of food um, that they would need to find some means to survive, not, not only from the storm, but also from starvation. There was a talk amongst the group in a, in a boat even uh, where they introduced the idea of, of perhaps um, taking the life of, of one of the team members for sustenance and that was voted down and it was decided that they were going to let nature take its course and um, if in fact someone were to perish they would they all agreed that they would use that individual as sustenance and um, in fact uh, that is what happened William Graves and Antonia were the two first to to pass away and that was actually on on Christmas Day um, and at this point, they were now at the camp of death. Um, the day after Christmas, December 26th, that was um, day 10. They also lost uh, Patrick Dolan and Lemuel Murphy, who was only 12 years old. Um, that was the younger brother of one of the women on the trip. Um, so, you know, at, at that point, the group had starved for six days straight. And um, for, for Sarah Fosdig and Marianne Graves, not only were they starved and obviously distraught from fatigue and, um, you know, everything else that goes along with it, but now they were also mourning the loss of their father. Um, and, and of course, for, for Sarah Foster, her younger brother as well. So, they're now mourning on top of being starved. So what happens next seems unfathomable, unfathomable, but after, after so many days of starvation on December 26, they decided at the camp of death that they would uh, use these deceased individuals as sustenance. So during the storm also to add to the anguish of everything going on, to keep the fire going that they had at camp of death, um, it was starting to, to fade in, in the night. So one of the members of the group actually got up with their hatchet to go search for more firewood and bring it back. And I took a swing and that, that hatchet head got lost in several feet of snow and was never to be seen again. So not only were they starving, but now they had lost one of their most important tools of their trip. And that was the ability to cut wood. Um, so again, this, this area where they ended up spending several days here uh, is known as the Camp of Death. And as part of the research for this journey, um, Bob and Tim did a bunch of research and found a group of forensic dogs and their trainers to come out to the site to to basically verify that this indeed was the camp of death site. So on two different occasions, these dogs came out. These are specially trained dogs that are able to locate and alert historic human remains. Um, in fact, they've got credit of finding remains that are 9,000 years old. Those are carbon dated remains in as deep of nine to 10 feet of soil. So they can scent out the remains through the soil. Um, they've done work for National Geographic, for major home developers, and also for Indian tribes all over the U.S. to, to search for ancient remains. So this group of dogs alerted separate from each other. We were all there to see this separate from each other in the same areas in the camp of death. Again, proving um, that something is out there. Um, so that happened right before we set out for the Forlorn Hope. So to witness these dogs alerting in this area that was such a special area, a, a very sad and solemn area, um, definitely was with us as we moved forward through the Camp of Death and uh, to Burnett Canyon. And we, we obviously gave tribute to those who had lost their lives there. And, and again, no dry eyes in this part of the journey for sure. Well, thanks, Alka. Um, what we're about to show you is a little footage that we, we've actually never shared before. Uh, so you'll be the first. We thought this was the, the right audience. And it's, it's just two minutes of um, where we believe the Camp of Death is. Camp of Death is, is one of those places along with, of course, Alder Creek and the cabins at the lake 
that um, is regarded as, as one of the most historic uh, spots in California and certainly in the Donner story. But Camp of Death was thought to never be able to be found because it, again, was not on a trail. They were lost. So we were, uh, I think, as shocked as anyone to um, have used our technology and seven years of, of field research and, and behind the scenes to narrow it down. And then when the dogs alerted on two separate occasions, 25 times in a very, very tight search box, um, it gets it up to about a 95% confidence that there are human remains there. Now we have not verified yet who they are, but that's to come. We're gonna show you a brief video of, of how remote uh, this place really is. So here we go. This is the North Fork of the American River. So as you can see, um, the camp of death and where these uh, poor folks wandered is um, a, the most barren, rugged land we've ever encountered as athletes. Um, it's a beautiful spot, but uh, as, uh, as Elka said, incredible, solemn moment for us when we uh, went through there on the expedition. Okay, I'm gonna throw it over to Tim now and he's gonna talk a little bit about what, what comes next after we left the camp of death. Yeah, so uh, the the bunch has just lost a third of their their group, right? They've uh, they've spent uh, four or five days at the camp of death. Several people had expired, and then they actually um, had consumed some of those folks and packed them away in their backpacks. To give you an idea, kind of the mental uh, outlook for these folks, this might have been a little bit. Although they had to resort to cannibalism to continue on, uh, they were probably feeling better than they'd had in, in several days, just because now the weather was clearing and they'd had something to eat. Uh, one of the um, previous, just before they got to Camp of Death, they had a little bit of an episode that gives you an idea of the, the onus that was set upon these folks and that they had the discussion about, well, hey, why don't we just turn back? It's one of the classic questions that comes up. Well, why didn't the Forlorn Hope just turn around and go back to the lake? What are they pressing on for? Well, since they lost Charles Stanton and he was already gone and they had no other leaders other than what little knowledge the two Indian uh, guys that accompanied them might have had, uh, the Indian guys decided, no, we're going back down to the valley. This is this is not our area. We're going to press on. There's no way we're going back to the lake. And then uh, Mary Graves, who which uh, was Franklin Graves, the second uh, daughter, just chimed in and she said, there is no way I can go back to the lake and listen to my brothers and sisters cry for food. So this was no way they could turn around and go back. Plus, it's, you know, now they're going way, they would have to go way back hill, trudge through all the snow they'd been through and then go back to an area that 
right before they left, one person had already died from malnutrition and starvation. So it was it was a train wreck back at the lake as well. But these guys had the onus of pressing on. And so they go back, uh, leave the camp of death and are, are going through this place called Burnett Canyon. And when we went through there, there was no trail at all in Burnett Canyon. And through some burns and other things that have gone on through there, it's, it's pretty rugged terrain as you'll see coming up. But what we're looking for is that in several of the documents that we read is there was a place where they got up onto this ridge. And as we leave Burnett Canyon, we get onto a place called Sawtooth Ridge that runs almost due uh, west along the north edge of the North Fork of the American River. And there's a place where we stopped where they, the group could finally see the Sacramento Valley. It's the first time since they left Independence, Missouri back in April that they would be able to see where they needed to go. And it's like the whole canyon opens up and you can see straight through the chute through a giant gap and uh, the North Fork of the American River straight through this slot and see the Sacramento Valley. So this is a point where we had to stop and say, this is where they must have seen the valley. It's, it's just one of the most, um, you, you can't describe it until you see it. When you see it in the video, you'll see why we had to stop there because this was a little bit of validation that this was a point where they, what they described in the books and the journals of where they saw the valley. Go ahead, Bob. Thanks, Tim. There it is. Um, we're standing almost precisely where, based upon the documentation that's available to us, and there's not a lot of primary research, where you can see uh, for 50, 60 miles out, all the way down to the Sacramento Valley. And it would have been the first time, as Tim said, that they set eyes on their destination. And, and what, what a fresh, what a joyful moment, but also uh, the thought of, look how far we have yet to go. I mean, we are, we, were, we should have been there two weeks ago, and we're still that far away. So next, uh, I think we're going to have Jen talk a little bit about what comes up next, because the fun has just begun for these poor people. They've been through the snowstorms, the camp of death, the wrong turn, Charles Stanton losing their guide. And now tell them what comes up next, Jen. <laughs> right, well, I want to reiterate what you said. I, at that moment for me, as someone who's raced in the North Fork and been to this ridge, um, never having seen it through this lens. I remember feeling very strongly in this picture you're looking at right now, that the scene before us was mythical. It was mythical in nature and that the, what you see between yourself and this golden promised land of California that they've been reading about since they left, uh, in the spring of that year is blocked by what appears to be large elephant silhouettes of blue. And so what you know at that moment as, as any human being is that you are looking at uh, valleys of 2000 feet or more, uh, multiple valleys between you and the place where help is. So at that moment, they're joyful because they're no longer lost they can see where they're going for the first time ever, but they are so far, far away. And we ourselves as athletes who push ourselves to have these kinds of limits, just thought, how, how did they keep going on? I mean, when you see that many valleys between you and your destination, in addition to knowing that at the bottom of each of those valleys is a massive river, um, is, is un, unthinkable to us that these people who had no intention of doing something so difficult were now faced with this. So I feel they were being once again asked to do something beyond human limits, beyond human comprehension, 
like eating your loved ones, like being asked to leave when experience groups got turned back three times, they are once again being asked to do something unfathomable to human limits. Um, and they're just simple people, five of them women, several of them men, uh, very young. And they're, they're, they're knowing that they have this mantle of responsibility. So they're looking at this view and they head down, slipping on snow, slipping all the way. We have the benefit of a trail and we come upon in the middle of nowhere, a, a dead deer in the trail that's been gutted but left behind. And we feel very strongly at that moment, what is going on? This is where the forlorn hope began to starve again. They've run out of their human food and they are going up 2000 feet incrementally, very exhausted. They're starving again. And we find a dead deer right about where they have to cross the river, head back up 2000 feet through through brush that can hardly be walked on as professional athletes. Um, and I know for myself, when I'm in the North Fork, I actually turn off my pain uh, meter and I just simply go up. I just go up and I say, don't think about it. Just walk as hard as you can and you'll get there. Don't think about it. These people were forced to think about every single step they took. They had just eaten their loved ones. They knew their death was imminent. But to survive meant that all of their loved ones would survive as well. So they come to the top of the ridge and it becomes an idea at this point, they're so hungry, they should kill the Indians. They should kill these two boys they don't know because they're Indians and because they're not family. Um, and Charles, uh, at that, Charles Stanton is gone. He's no longer their protector. And William Eddy takes it upon himself to tip them off. You need to get out of here or you're going to get eaten. And they disappear in the night. So at that moment, they're without two more members, uh, two members they were thinking about eating and because they were so desperate and they are just trudging with bloodied feet as, as, Bob, as Bob said, they're bloodied, they're exhausted, they're starving again. And they head into Iowa Hill where there is uh, some flat land, but they know they're going back down again. And I want to say at this point that one person in particular is suffering mightily. And he is the husband of a young wife uh, who's already lost Franklin Graves. Uh, he is unable to keep up. He's falling farther and farther behind. And two people, William Eddy and one of the women go ahead and they find a sick and dying deer and they shoot it after much effort. And he hears the gunshot and says, if I can just get to their, to their kill, I'll live, but he doesn't live. He doesn't live through the night. His wife lays with him till midnight and he dies there. And by the time William Eddy and Mary make it back with the deer remains, he has already been carved up by other members of the party for sustenance because they're that desperate. And I'll leave it here for the next part of the video. There's a, there's a little missing story in the Donner Party. And, and so I said, you know, these guys didn't quite, quite get their due, right, for what they had to deliver to save their families. Which is true. And, and then almost every day we've been out there, it almost seems more unimaginable to us. Awesome. Going, How did they do that? <laughs> So um, we arrived late, as you can see, we had to run into the night because the climb and the traverse and the snow and the brush was even beyond uh, our comprehension. So we did arrive at Iowa Hill 
um, for our third night. And it's at that point where um, I'm gonna ask uh, Elka to pick up the story. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, so of course, at this point, we're on the Forest Hill Divide, right? We're, we're at Iowa Hill. And <clears throat> we've got Luis and Salvador that are missing at this point. And the group, again, um, you know, we cover this in one day, but it's, it's several days for the Forlorn Hope. And they're again met with starvation and exhaustion, and they have another trip down into the North Fork again, downstream from where they had crossed earlier um, to get up to the other side, what we now know as Colfax. And it, they've lost their shoes at this point. They're using bits and pieces of blankets to cover their feet. Their feet are, are just macerated and, and bloody and bruised and uh, they're barely able to move, but they're starting to work out of the snow and, and see dirt for the first time, which is, you know, got to lift their spirits, I would imagine. Um, there are still some snow drifts that as they make their way back up to, to Colfax, uh, but it's, it's again, without food and that snow that was, that they met up earlier now turns to rain and that that rain is really cold um, at a certain point along that trip um, they they spot the Miwok Luis and, and uh, Salvador's bloody footprints in the snow and they follow them and uh, it's at this point when William Foster decides that he's going to end the lives of the Indians and um, William Eddy tried to stop him but unsuccessfully and so uh, the, two, the two Indians at that point perished. And again, they use the Indians for, for sustenance. Um, but the good news is at this point is the terrain eases as the snow turns into rain and they're finally met with several nice days of weather, but everyone is completely exhausted. Uh, for two weeks, they continue to move and um, on January 12th, they came across human footprints and they followed those footprints to a Nisanon Indian settlement. And it was there where the, the Nisanon Indians fed them acorn bread and gave them some, some nutrition to try to get their, their energy back. And while it helped a bit, um, it was just too much essentially. For, for the women, um, five women and, and William Foster, because their feet were just completely destroyed. They were completely exhausted. Um, it was at this point that William Eddy took it upon himself, um, even though he was unable to eat what the Indians were giving him, he survived off grass and what, whatever he could possibly get down of the acorn bread. And went along with one of the Indians there from the settlement um, until they came across another settlement with, with um, additional help for him. They traded tobacco essentially for the additional help of, of another Indian. And these two Indians were able to guide William Eddy to Johnson's ranch so that in fact, uh, William Eddy could let them know that the other six were still behind. And I'll, I'll give it to Tim to talk about the entry into the Johnson's Ranch. We're going to roll a little film, Elka, just to show folks what it looks like um, between uh, Colfax, essentially crossing the river again and then into the foothills. And, uh, and then we're going to uh, talk about Johnson's Ranch. So here, here's a little sample of, of what they saw, although they were along the Bear River. We had to run on roads because we couldn't get through the private land, but you'll get an idea of the the change in topology um, that, uh, that they encountered.
Tim. Sorry about that. Okay. So we're going to have Tim talk a little bit about the end of the journey. So we've now been through the foothills. We've gone about 85-ish uh, miles to this point, and um, we're now beginning to turn our attention to the, to the end, which is Johnson's Ranch. And Tim will tell you a little bit about the history of Johnson's Ranch. Many of you may, may or may not know about that or where it is, but we, we were granted uh, permission. It's on private land. Uh, we were granted permission to, to come onto that, um, that property, which... Uh, Tim will talk about. Yeah, so that picture you see right there now is, is an, a, going through Niger vine, Vineyards in Auburn. The, the trail crosses just north of Auburn at Lake of the Pines, and we wind our way down to Camp Far West. Uh, you might know that large lake just uh, s uh, south of uh, Beale Air Force Base. We go around uh, Camp Far West, and uh, we uh, hop through a little, you'll see a little barbed wire fence we go to. But the final approach into Johnson's Ranch is, is this long, uh, dirt rut and that is actually the same wagon ruts from 1846 the same place johnson's ranch at that time in 1846 1847 1848 was seeing 100 wagons a day go through there and that was the first place that these pioneers would have seen real humans again or real supplies since they left fort bridger which would have been in south west wyoming so it's a thousand mile trek from the last place that they saw civilization until they saw uh, another different set of humans than the folks they were traveling with and it was a very emotional time for everybody on the team i know i was i was balling and i'm sure everybody else was i'm actually a little bit ahead of the group when you see it because i was just an, i was just thinking of these people and what it must have been like to finally make it to Johnson's Ranch. As you know, Eddie was the only one who made it to the ranch on their own power, even though he was being propped up by two Indian guides. And they had to go back six miles. And the way they found the other the folks was they just followed the bloody footprints from William Eddie back to where the other six had stopped and said they'd gone as far as they could possibly make it. And they shepherded them back to Johnson's Ranch. But if you go out there today, you'd see a couple of monuments out on the road, Smartville Road or in downtown Wheatland, but that Johnson Ranch, Johnson Ranch is on a private piece of property right along the Bear River on a working ranch. And we were lucky enough to get access through some contacts in the Wheatland Historical Society. And today there is only a little wooden sign that says Johnson's Ranch. But there are some plans by the Oregon California Trail Association and some other folks to try to bring that back as a state park or a monument. And uh, you'll see when we get there, it's a pretty solemn thing. This was no celebration. Uh, it was really just kind of a culmination of representing these folks that had made this trip 174 years before us. And what we had done all along the way is, as you saw at the very beginning of this presentation, we had created tribute cards to everybody that, that uh, the 15 that started with where they were from, a picture of from, what they'd done in their lives, how long they were around, uh, kids and occupations and whatnot. We carried those all the way along the way. And as we approached the very final spot there, Johnson Ranch, where we had just said with the COVID, we had our families and then some historical folks that had helped us along the way. We just walked up to the sign that said Johnson Ranch and laid those tribute cards at the foot of that sign and then had a chance to reflect with our families. But it was a pretty emotional I mean, I, I know I'm speaking for the team, but I mean, I don't know if in the 40 plus years I've competed in sports and done things that there was anything as meaningful as what we had just finished in the seven years of research and field work and then doing this expedition to represent these folks. It was incredibly emotional. So Bob, you wanna show the film? You bet. <laughs>
Uh, need a moment, sorry. So um, that, that ends uh, the journey for us. That was the expedition. And I hope, I hope um, we were able to convey um, most importantly, how incredible these ordinary people were in doing this extraordinary act. Um, their impact on the Donner Party and on California and American history um, is, is tremendous and, and probably not well known. Um, so we're going to transition actually to that topic. And this chart is trying to ask the question, what was the impact of the Forlorn Hope on the Donner Party? And this chart shows all of the people from the time they left uh, uh, Independence, Missouri, on around April 15th, 1846, to uh, approximately April a year later that perished along the way and, and then at, at the, uh, the lake or at Alder Creek or during the relief. And um, you can see 42 people perished of the entire Donner Party. That's 46%, nearly half the people perished. Now that's with the Forlorn Hope making it. We asked the question, if the Forlorn Hope hadn't reached Johnson's Ranch, what would have been the, the incremental impact? And we've done a fair bit of research looking at the, the, the condition of the people that did pass and the condition of the people that were surviving. We continue to research this. This is one of our many research projects, but our, our conclusions so far are that if the Forlorn Hope had not reached Johnson's Ranch, an additional 25 lives would have likely been lost. So if you ask yourself, what was the impact of the Forlorn Hope? Well, at the very least, 25 lives, 25 Californians lives were saved uh, for the effort that they did. And of course, much, much more. So we thought we'd talk a little bit about this, you know, topic um, and, you know, why, uh, why again, uh, does it, does it have so much meaning in the context of California itself? And um, I'm going to let the, my teammates chip in a little bit here, and then we're going to also talk about the, uh, the will to survive, but uh, Tim or Elka or, or uh, Jen, do you have anything to add? You know, the one thing that we that I was saying is not not only uh, what, what this Forlorn Hope group had made it to Johnson Ranch, you can imagine if they had not gone out and made it, they would have had 15 more mouths to feed at Donner Lake along the way. And that's about 15 out of uh, what we say, 85 people, let's call it a nice round number. You're talking another 15, 20% that they would have had to generate as far as food and sustenance at the lake to keep them going, right? So, you know, their impact on this whole bunch getting back to the lake uh, was, uh, you know, monumental to make those other folks be able to survive. It wasn't, I don't think, Bob, like at least another two weeks to uh, that, that uh, the other relief parties started to make their way up to the to the lake knowing that the forlorn hope had made it and uh you know the little early relief came uh, and you know it's worth mentioning too the the ratio of women survivors to to male survivors and you know just in in my opinion um as a mom of course and and it's it's the same same is true for for fathers as well but that will to survive so that you can somehow do whatever you possibly can to help your, your children survive, um, your family survive. That, that will to live has to be just tremendous, uh, not to mention the fact that biologically too, women tend to store more body fat and we have slower metabolism. So we tend to deal with starvation a little bit more easily than men with, with more muscle mass and faster metabolisms. And, and two things I would add to that on Elka's comment is that um, in addition to the survival rate for women is also the premise that for many of the young men, um, what was asked of them going through the Wasatch Mountains, uh, clearing the trail that, that Hastings had lied to them about being uh, open and easy, they ended up on a trail that required massive amounts of rock removal, tree removal. Those young men were asked to do that. Um, and they arrived at Donner Lake with, with very low energy stores. So what heroes they were for doing that. Um, and we've talked a lot about this, um, that 
that each individual party, uh, each individual person in the Donner Party was a hero in their own right, the people that lost their lives and the people that survived. And to add to Tim's point, which is just, it's, it's unthinkable what they, what they went through um, back at the lake. I think that in many regards, the Forlorn Hope not only saved people's lives physically by bringing back a relief party during the Mexican-American War, which had taken most of the men and the food from California to fight that war. Uh, they came and rang the alarm, which during a year of high flooding, it was very difficult to get people to come, prepare food and head out on the mules to, to rescue them. They, without that rescue, none of them maybe would have survived. But more than that, the fact that 17 able-bodied people set out and 15 continued on meant that those people at the lake knew there were 15 dedicated moms and dads and young people, strong people, who were on their way to this magical California that they thought was only five days away. And that gave them the will to live. If those people had never left the lake, they wouldn't have had the will to live. So that's something really neat to think about. We can only conjecture. So we wanna finish up here tonight by just giving you a look at what we're, we're continuing to do. So the, the expedition is over, it was successful. Um, but it really just whet our appetite for this notion of combining the outdoors and living history. And so we have five initiatives that are underway uh, for this year and next year. Um, we are hoping to do an, a proper archeological dig at the Camp of Death. Um, we're in the midst of trying to get funding for that and approvals. Um, and uh, we, we probably will do that this year. Um, we're, we're, we're working with the um, Explore, Explorers Club, the infamous Explorers Club for some funding. And um, we also are working with state-of-the-art technology uh, maps that have come out of the military and out of gaming to bring maps alive so that we can actually show interactions of people and movements and the sociological uh, relationships between the two of them, conflicts and friendships, and how that impacts groups like the Donner Party in terms of their uh, survival ability. So lots of new technology coming that we hope to bring to California here and to NorCal and share with all of you in the future. Um, we, we, we intend to do a documentary about the Forlorn Hope. Um, six episodes, probably an hour and a half total. Um, we've had um, a lot of interest, inbound interest from you know the History Channel or Smithsonian, Nat Geo. Um, again, something that we're in the midst of, of trying to pull the funding together. We have the, uh, the story built and um, we have a lot of the film already in the can, but we've uh, we got to finish getting the funding done and then pull that together. Um, education, outside curriculum, we talked about it. We really believe um, in bringing the children and adults to the field and trying to combine um, a history with being outside and, and enjoying the outdoors, but also learning while you're there. And there's nothing like touching or stepping uh, in places where history has occurred. It, it's, it, it, it makes the hair on your entire body stand up when you know you're standing at the very spot of someone famous or you've touched a railing of someone that you know went before you that has had such an impact on our lives. And lastly, myth busting. We found along the way, a lot of things that were inconsistent or, or just downright wrong in the telling of the history of some of these stories. And so working with our partners at Berkeley and Stanford, we're hoping to um, uh, correct those and then get them published by peer reviewed journals so we can get history corrected. Um, our team is uh, tremendous. Uh, you, of course, the four uh, uh, the two athletes and the co-leads here at the top, uh, Elka, Jen, Tim, and Bob, but uh, Keith Sutter, a uh, 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 Nat Geo, uh, Patagonia North Face adventurer and photographer, videographer uh, is on our team and did all the beautiful filming uh, as well as some, El uh, some from Elka. Um, he remains on our team. Katie Moore is in uh, actually France. She's a documentary and filmmaker, internationally recognized and outdoor enthusiast, Frank Mullen. Uh, wrote the Chronicle of the Donner Party, one of the um, best and beloved books about the Donner. He's also a journalist and a teacher at uh, University of Reno, and he's also a reenactor. And so he is our um, kind of historian on the film to make sure that we get it right. 
Uh, Bill Oltergeist is in charge of the uh, Donner Summit Historical Society. He's an author, a teacher, he's a bit of mentor to us throughout. Uh, Bill Holmes, the same, a researcher, advisor. He's with the Wheatland Historical Society, and he's trying to get Johnson Ranch turned into a state park. That's his uh, mission. And uh, Brian uh, DeLay and, and Mark Brilliant have recently joined our team, two PhDs at uh, UC uh, Berkeley. Uh, both are American history scholars, well published, and um, they've added new energy to help us learn how to be more efficient and more effective in our research. And lastly, uh, John and Kaylee there uh, is in charge of forensics. John's a PhD from Stanford and uh, has been doing uh, forensics work uh, after he retired as a physicist for about 20 years. He was down uh, doing uh, the Nat Geo work, uh, trying to find Amelia Earhart in Fiji, and then at Alder Creek, Starve Camp, and now he's helping us with Camp of Death. So it's, it's a really first-class team. We want to thank uh, all these groups that we've tapped into, resources, um, it's been absolutely tremendous, the outpouring of support in, in, in people uh, willing to help give us advice. Um, uh, Tim and I, when we started this, we're absolutely just, just, you know, we'd like to read history books. And we're not researchers, we're not historians, we're complete neophytes. Um, so uh, we didn't know what we didn't know. And we, we, what we did know is we needed help. And um, so these organizations have been tremendously gracious with their time. But the work goes on, and so you know we're always looking for help to, to make Sacramento um, to educate and inspire here in Sacramento. So we know with 400 members strong, um, there are, are are incredible talents right here on this call and in your midst. So we would love advice and assistance, of course, help in, in helping us find the right funding. My contacts at the bottom, Bob at mustanggroup.com, and we we welcome feedback, input, help anything at all, um, we, uh, we would be humbled by that. So with that, um, we have taken up a lot of your time tonight um, and I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. I know it's, uh, it's gone longer than probably normal, but it's a big topic. And we are here for Q&A. Uh, we're gonna throw it um, back to uh, the folks at uh, Henry and- We're ready to go, brother. We're ready to go. So uh, <laughs> we, it's Greg. We're going to, uh, nicely done. Thank you very much. That was extraordinary and unique for damn sure. So uh, it was one of the uh, uh, most um, uh, living history kind of dynamics I think we've ever uh, seen presented. The uh, I think it's time to open it up for questions uh, with all due respect. And yeah, we ran about approximately just a shade under 90 minutes there, but it was, you, have, you haven't really lost anybody. You've had excellent retention, just so you know. So um, let's take it from there and go with some, open it up for questions. Uh, Morris, can you unmute everybody? They can, they're allowed to unmute themselves. Does anyone have any questions? Well, I, I would, my, my first question is, is there any relationship between long distance running and uh, that, the, 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 what you run into along the way uh, in your extreme sports experience and what you think transpired with the members of uh, uh, the Forlorn Hope as it related to uh, just fighting to survive based on willpower and you know little energy. Do you think there's a similarity there or am I delusional? <laughs> Why don't you take that, Tim? Yeah, I think, I think there's definitely uh... Uh, correlation there you know when we get to the last uh, what we call you know the last 20 miles of let's say a 100 mile run or you're on some you know multi-day grind uh, you're just looking at putting one foot in front of the other even if you are a tremendous athlete and I think that's what these guys were going through the, the other thing that that I, I I noted when we were out there is the the, the more tired and the more uh, you know beat up you are the more grumpy and argumentative you are. I don't know if you've ever stayed up for 24 or 36 or 48 hours but you turn into a grouch and you're really short and you tend to argue a lot and you want to get your your thoughts through and I, I can't imagine the dynamics in this group when they were pushing along after they'd lost Stanton now they've lost Charles Franklin Graves we're kind of the glue of the bunch they're the ones that have built the snowshoe put the plan together now they're you know 10 people wandering in the wilderness lost and the dynamics of that group and how they 
proceeded down the trail has been fascinating to us. That's why we keep digging into the people because uh, trying to get consensus out of that group or any of that, if you've ever been as tired where you've been up for 48 or 72 hours at a time, you understand what that's like. Yeah, even, even deciding who on any given day is going to lead the group once they're lost. And, and I would agree with that as someone who just did Eco Challenge, which is considered the world's toughest race, but you're four people having to make every decision together. Um, those dynamics would have been brutal. To, so what Tim said is exactly right. Who's the leader? Who's making the decisions that's going to dictate whether you succeed or fail at this mission? It must have been brutal. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Go right ahead. Yeah. I, my question is, has any of you looked into the diary of John Markle? Uh, it's, it, uh, this is a Donner Trail rider from 1936. It's the only true and authentic account of the exact location of the route of the Donner Trail. It's, it's one of the books, Thomas, that we have. So it is one of the references for sure. Um, yeah. The, the uh, of course, the challenge we ran into is when they went off course, then nobody, nobody documented it. And so um, it, it, John got us to a point, kind of, kind of where Carpenter's Flat was. And then we, uh, we had, to, we had to really spend more and more time in the field um, figuring out if you're exhausted, tired, lost, and can't dead reckon, then the common sense is you go where the path of least resistance, what's the easiest route to go? And so a lot of what our field work did was standing there and going, well, what's the easiest way? Because that's probably what they would have done. Yeah, that, uh, that diary, that, uh, well, John Markle was my wife's uh, great, great, great grandfather. And uh, anyway, that, that uh, diary is in the uh, Auburn uh, Museum, I mean, the library. I have made a copy of it uh, many years ago. And uh, so it's kind of interesting to read some of it in there. Awesome, thank you. I have a couple of questions. <laughs> um, I was wondering when you guys were taking the trail or the route, um, if you guys marked it so that in the future, people might be able to experience those locations. Yes, a Allison, we did mark it. It's actually all, uh, you know, we use technology, so GPS, right? So we dropped thousands of waypoints and uh, we actually allowed people to track us. So uh, we wore a tracker and for the five days you could track along and watch us move along. And of course uh, that's dropping breadcrumbs, essentially digital breadcrumbs the whole way. We did take the map down. And the reason we took it down was because we actually traveled through some private land. And uh, part of the agreement was that uh, once we did it and they, we got proper permission, we, we wouldn't leave it up at least for now, simply because that would encourage people to try to follow us and they wouldn't have permission. And of course they'd be treading on private land. Um, so it's, a, it's an ongoing dilemma for trails like this where some of it's on private land and some of it's on, on public land. And, um, and so, but we hope to put it back up in the future with ear, uh, basically designating, okay, go here, but then you have to stop here because it's private. And so that's part, part of what we'll do with those digital maps we talked about is come back and put it up so other people can go out and do it on their own and enjoy it. That's, that's a goal for sure. Great. Um, and sorry, two more questions, but they kind of go together. Um, kind of an amateur Donner Party historian. I've been studying it for years. My family makes fun of me. Um, but uh, do you have a list of the books that you used as research? Um, I noticed that I probably own more than half of what you guys shared on your video. But I um, was wondering if there are any of the books that you had that gave a lot of information about Lewis and Salvador since we don't have much information about them, I've noticed. Yes, there's, there, we have a website. So uh, it's called forlornhope.org, forlornhope.org. And on there, you'll see, if you click, you'll see the whole bibliography and all of our reference resources. There's probably a hundred references there. And you're welcome to take a look at that. And, and uh, there's a lot of links, interactive links uh, to either buy the books or some of them are free online or which library has them. 
In terms of Luis and Salvador, um, there are some books there that uh, the, the Nobner book being an 18, uh, uh, 1925 book that probably is the, the most preeminent book on uh, Native Americans in California, but there is very little information about Luis and Salvador. And one of our pursuits is, is, is connecting with um, folks that know uh, the oral history uh, keepers in the Nisnan tribe. And we have yet, because of COVID, been able to meet up but our hope is to meet up with the oral, uh, the keeper of the oral history. And we are told they have the oral history of the Forlorn Hope. And uh, obviously uh, when we, if we're, we're given the privilege to have that conversation, we'll try to record it and then share it with everybody because uh, it would be a perspective that has yet been told. Um, uh, if you can hear me, I have a uh, follow-up question regarding books. Um, and I see that on your bibliography on my computer, you did have this one, the, uh, if you can see that one, did, was that a good book to, for a reference? I know it doesn't, it doesn't really talk about the John R. Party specifically, but what was interesting for me was the other routes taken by wagons that went earlier, um, as opposed to going right over the saddle of the summit and going around other areas. Um, and then the second book, and I just, I think I just saw it on your site was the, the Johnson Ranch one also, which I have, I just got it, so I haven't read it yet, but would, would this be a good reference book in, in your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I'll talk about the Steed book, which is what you just held up, um, and sure. then one of the other team can talk about the Graydon book. Yes, they're, they're both very good references. The Steed book um, is great, although Johnson's Ranch is on private land, and so it gets you, it gets you all excited, and then you can't go do anything about it. Um, Correct. <laughs> but uh, but it's it's they're right. They found it. And, and indeed, they were connected with the historical society there in, in Wheatland. So it's a good it is a very accurate reference book for sure. Um, I don't know if one there of the is. other want to talk about Graydon because Graydon is also a great book. I don't know, Tim. Yeah, Graydon might be the best map book that's available as far as showing the route that that's really just an excellent reference from the route itself. And, and uh, you know, it, it, you guys are probably, I don't know if you know that, but I mean the, the, um, Oh gosh, what is it? Uh, Trails West, right? The Trails West folks have marked the immigrant route from the middle of Nevada all the way to Johnson's Ranch with, uh, you know, the T markers. And you can follow that. They have guidebooks, but uh, most of it's done by car. If you want to do it on foot, then that takes a little bit more homework. And uh, you got to be willing to get out of your car and wander around in the weeds like we did. Um, but it is marked and it's uh, well documented from, you know, pretty much the whole route that we took. If you took the regular Donner route, the, obviously the part the Forlorn Hope took is a little bit more cryptic. Correct. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. And thank you for a great presentation. It was wonderful to watch. Thank you. Appreciate it. A question from one of our viewers. Did the lower, did the lower route generally follow Sutterville, Smartville Road and Camp Beale Highway to Spencerville Road to Wheatland? Was that the route basically, sort of? Sounds like a local that knows their way. Um, I, I was going to say the second route that got got into existence was the route that took um, Nevada City Road and went through there and then came into Johnson's Ranch from that area, right? And that's another route that got developed not too long because these guys were pretty smart. These these immigrant guys weren't, you know, they were going to take the most expeditious route. And actually the route that the, the Truckee River route, which would they take, was pretty much I don't want to say obsolete, but at five years later, they everybody was coming over on the Carson route and coming into Placerville. And then the Beckworth route came into existence. And there was all these other routes because they wanted to find something way easier than Donner Pass. And you guys, historians of Donner, know that, you know, they had Donner Pass originally. Then they went up to Roller Pass. And that's a really entertaining one. If you ever make it up there, it's on the PCT. And then the third one was Coldstream pass which is right on underneath uh, Donner Donner Peak between uh, Mount Judah and Donner Peak and all of those are marked with uh, with either uh, historic monuments or uh, T markers so that you know where when you're in the right spot but even this bunch that we're trying to make it to Johnson's were over time we're using three different passes as they found their way over the hill and then down down once they got to Bear Valley there were a number of, of different routes well as well as um, as you get closer to Johnson Ranch, we didn't get to follow the, the course that we believed existed, which is where the settlements, not uh, the Neeson settlements, would, which would have been along the Bear River. 
Um, we didn't get to go there because there was lots of private land and we couldn't get permission. So we had to kind of skirt around and head into the foothills and you saw where that uh, winery was. Uh, we were not on the accurate route and we knew it, but we actually have the accurate route uh, mapped out. Another viewer asks, on the information on William McFadden Foster, where did you find that at? Um, it, 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 I wonder if the question is specifically around whether he did or did not murder Luis and Salvador. I, I'm not sure. There's, there's a lot of um, discussion in hist history about um, whether he did or did not. And we'll tell you what we know. Uh, what we know is that um, through Eddie, who kept a very terse journal and then was interviewed by Al Alakid uh, Sinclair soon after he arrived. And then that was passed on to Edwin Bryant, who has written many books and had a diary himself about his crossing. Through that and then uh, 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 Thornton, Quinn Thornton, those, those resources all sort of circled on the fact that he um, did indeed um, encounter the Indians. They were near dead, according to Foster, uh, along a creek. And he essentially said, they're, they're, they're already gone. I'm going to finish them off. And he took his pistol and, and shot each one of them in the head. Um, Eddie tried to stop him. He wrestled with him. He found at that point that Foster had literally become uh, maniacal. He had lost his mind. He was so starved and so frustrated. Eddie uh, ultimately couldn't stop him. And so everyone else, the other six turned their back. And the deed was done and it happened. Um, essentially, there were no eyewitnesses per se. Um, but um, it happened and they did partake in using both Luis and Salvador for sustenance that we know. Um, the, at the time, um, unfortunately, uh, murdering an Indian and a Native American was not against the law at that time. And so Foster was never brought to trial. He was never arraigned. He was never actually uh, just beyond it being part of the story accused of anything at that point. And, and that's the end of the story. Um, and uh, needless to say, the, as the Forlorn Hope were interviewed, um, they began to, if you will, spin the stories pretty quickly because imagine coming to a new place in California and, and now your legacy is that you are on this horrendous trip and committing cannibalism and then witnessing murders. And that's your, how do you do, hello, um, welcome to California. So these people needed to, 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 they wanted to fade into the fabric of what was the new Republic of California. And the last thing they were gonna do is go out of their way and, and point out all of these horrible things. So it's really hard for anyone to really know because accurate diaries weren't kept and Eddie's diary has been lost. So the best we know is what people have speculated. And another viewer states and she's Alice Osborne from Raleigh, North Carolina. She just finished up 12 original songs about the Donner Party and Forlorn Hope with the point of view from the women and their quotes. And she's also working on a novel about William Eddy set in 1859. Any comments? Ladies? We saw some of your songs that is amazing that you're so far into the women's uh, point of view. We we were asked, Elka and I were asked to come um, with the perspective of moms. We're both moms and daughters and women, of course. So I'm really, really interested in hearing all of your songs and the lyrics and your reasoning behind them, because I know I have points of view about the different women and perhaps their role, newly married, um, a young girl, Belle of the Ball, you know, Belle of the Party. So, so fascinated with how you found your historical information to write your songs. Yeah, I think that's a great, it's a great thing that you did that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, they're so young and um, they were, three of them were moms and the fact that they survived is a testament to their love. I, I said at the end of the journey, I don't know how they did it, but I know why they survived because they loved their children and their 
their moms and their families. Yeah. And I've said before that I feel like, um, it's, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to give up when you know that you've got children behind. Yeah. Yeah. No matter how much you're suffering. I can't hardly get through a dinner date without knowing where my kids are when they were babies. So I can't imagine leaving them behind at a lake where people I knew were already dying of starvation. I can't yeah. imagine the anguish. Yeah, not to mention the women they had to leave them with making those decisions. That's a whole other discussion, right? But making the decisions of, you know, who, who do I feed? My children, their children. Um, this is so tough. Yeah, and the basic question being, I'm guessing you came to is, do you stay and protect your children and other people's children, or do you go and risk it all? Are you the hero by going out, or are you the hero by staying and protecting? Yep. As a mom, that's the biggest question you have. So thank you. I can't wait to see your, um, all, your, your whole body of work. We can't hear you. She's got the beanie. Alice, you got to unmute. You got to unmute. Oh, she's unmuted. I don't know if the microphone is connected. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I was inspired by episode five of the of the video mm -hmm. of Johnson's Ranch, and I cried twice after watching it. And then I wrote my last song, and it's not from the point of view of the women. It's from William Eddy's point of view. And the first line is, don't cry, child, please. Don't cry, child, please let me in. Because he comes in and Harriet Ritchie bursts into tears. Mm -hmm. And so the song is about um, when it rains in the valley, when it rains in the valley, um, the mountains fill with snow. And he's telling them, you have to hurry. You have to hurry or more will die. And I do it in a very succinct pop folk song. But I just want to say I'm playing it out and it's it's getting really good. And I will, um, it's on my YouTube now and I will get all this stuff together. So thank you. I have goosebumps. I got goosebumps when you talked about that. You can't that wait. Was you. It was, it was uh, your forlorn hope. So that's what made my last song. Well, that's kind. It, it sounds like it was actually uh, William Eddy, which it should be. And of course, some of you may not know, but William Eddy actually tried to go back in the first relief. He was, uh, he had left his um, children and his uh, wife uh, behind and he couldn't make it because he was still too exhausted from the trip and um, ultimately made it back in relief three. And that was almost a month and so later. And it wasn't until he got there that he got the news that his, uh, his family had perished. So a very sad story for a very brave man. And, and Foster had the same uh, fate. His wife was with him, of course, on Fall on Hope, but he too lost the majority of his family. So these brave people doing everything selflessly, and then to go back and find out that the very reason they left, which was to save their own family, uh, they failed. Right. And in my album, I crisscross between, between um, Tamsin Donner, who left her husband, I mean, who left her ch children to be with her husband and William Eddy, who saves her children. So they're, they're the counterpoint, point and counterpoint of the story. And they're the heart. To me, they are the heart of the story, Tamsin Donner and William Eddy. Brilliant. Heart that. Brilliant. So thank you. And I just, oh, one thing, um, William Eddy, he, I would say he's, it was an extraordinary man. He was not ordinary. He grew up in Lynch's River, South Carolina. And all that is just nasty brush and swampland. So it prepared him and he had a German mother and who was descended from Prussians and he had it in his, um, his makeup to be an extraordinary person. And I felt that he was put in that place to help other people. Like, so it was, it was by divine guidance. He was the right person at the right time. Wow. Really cool. I have a very relevant Sacramento uh, related question from Bill George, which is, what was John Sutter and the Fort's role in um, the uh, Forlorn Hope story? Yeah, so great question. So um, just briefly, what happened was um, the first person to, to, as they were coming across the plains, the first person that went on to, to, uh, to Sutter was actually um, um, 
uh, William Eddy and, uh, or sorry, Charles Stanton and, and uh, McCutcheon. And, and they were sent ahead to get provisions because they, they were clearly going to run out before they got even to the foot of the Sierra. Um, and, and Sutter was very accommodating and immediately uh, provided provisions on loan, um, loaded them back up, and they came back over. Meantime, uh, uh, Reed, James Reed, got into a, a tussle and ended up uh, manslaughtering uh, one of the Teamsters, and they banished him. So then he was forced to go out, and he made it to Sutter's Ranch. And that's about the time the, uh, the Mexican War was on, and so he got drafted got sent down to Yuba Buena, San Francisco, and he fought. And it wasn't until he was done fighting that he was able to then muster people to say, hey, now that we're done fighting here, I've got to get people to get back there and save all these people. We don't know where they are. They have never made it. Um, and so again, Sutter helped muster, bring the people together um, and, uh, and provided resources. Of course, uh, Luis and Salvador were two guides that, that, that were Sutter guides that he gave to uh, um, uh, Charles Stanton. And he also gave him six mules. And so Sutter played an integral role in both those points. And then once they started to do the each of the four relief parties, most of the resources were coming from Sutter's Fort or Johnson's Ranch. So they were um, recruiting men, all, all men in uh, around uh, Yuba Buena, uh, San Francisco, then Sutter's Fort, and then recruited the rest of the men at Johnson's Ranch. And it's at Johnson's Ranch where they would stage the food, get it ready, get the mules, get the men, figure out how much they're going to get paid, who's going where. And so um, uh, I think it's fair to say that Sutter played an integral role in, in uh, both the Forlorn Hope and obviously the Donner Party, as we know. Yeah, you know, a couple of fun facts there is, you know, Reed made it, tried to make his own rescue attempt before he ended up going out to the Mexican War and couldn't get back to the lake. He ended up having to leave all his provisions and had to turn around at Mule Springs, which is uh, in the Bear Valley. The other one is uh, talk about a, a an honorable guy. Stanton had made it over the pass with the mules and. And when it, uh, they got into like Summit Valley, they couldn't get the mules through and they could have kept going and probably made it out in Bear Valley. Probably what would that have been? Maybe mid-November to maybe third week in November before these guys got stuck. But he, he told Sutter, I'm, I, I owe him these mules and I can't leave them behind or I won't be able to go back and face Sutter back at, the, back at Sutter's Fort. So he turned around and went back to the lake with the mules and the others that had made it all that way. And so he was a pretty honorable guy if he was willing to do that. Yeah, and it turns out those mules that they brought back to the lake all got buried in snow and they weren't even used for sustenance, so they all died anyways. Yeah. Cost him his life ultimately. Yep. But he was a he was a guy of great honor. And you did mention that there was oral traditional history from the Nisanan Americans. Was there anything from the Miwok Americans? <laughs> We haven't, we haven't had the opportunity. Yes, we believe there was. And it, part of the confusion in the history books is, is they, they mixed up who Luis and Salvador were with the, the settlements that were encountered by the Forlorn Hope. Because uh, um, Luis and Salvador are believed to have come from Miwok tribes in the Bay Area and came back with uh, the folks that had fought the war to Sutter's Fort, um, it was presumed by many authors that the settlements that the Forlorn Hope encountered along the Bear River were Miwok. Well, well, they weren't. Miwok weren't anywhere near there, and particularly in the winter, they were Nisnan tribes. And so um, it's two different oral histories that need to be pursued. One would be, what's the oral history of Luis and Salvador? And then what's the oral history of the Forlorn Hope's encounter of the settlements along the Bear River? both of which we want to pursue. Uh, not an easy thing to do in COVID. <laughs> yeah. uh, and if, if there's anyone out there listening that has uh, relationships and, and uh, could, could provide some introductions to either tribe, please let us know. Again, it's bob at mustanggroup.com. We would, we would be so grateful. Yeah, and what's interesting about that and all the research that we did, there's just very little written documentation on that. I mean, you, you can find stuff on the Donner Party, Forlorn Hope, this and that and the other thing. But when it comes to documentation of the Indian tribe locations, the specific areas they were in, we found some. But boy, we dug hard and what we got was really of limited uh, value. 
So the, the, the oral history is probably going to be the best reliable um, stuff we can we can look into. Any other it, questions? Yeah, exactly. I do think, Ed, uh, Bob, we've got a shot at uh, connect, making a c connection for the Miwok, uh, or through the Miwok Museum in Roseville. That would be awesome. All right, I think we wrap it up, everybody. Nice job, beautiful job, guys. Thank you so much. That was spectacular, honestly, and uh, greatly uh, appreciated and uh, respected, to say the least, in terms of the effort that you've put forth. And we'll be glad to uh, keep keep a surprise, and we'll work with you again in the future. So this has been a joy for us to uh, and an honor for us to put put this on with you guys. One last thing I want to mention to everybody is May sixth is our inaugural. Eight hour, eight hour history a thon big day of giving event and so please join in and and uh we'll we'll have it we'll have eight different programs going that day uh and they're all all types of sacramento history involved in that thank you all good night everybody Happy night. thank you thank you for having us it's been an honor uh, yeah it's reciprocal brother thank you okay thank you very much thank you very much really really fascinating Okay, Bob, you can say anything you want. What would you like to really say? Where'd he go? <laughs> hey, Peter, how are you? you got I'm fine. Here? Unfortunately, uh, I, uh, my, my alarm clock didn't work, so I was more than one hour late. But I hope <laughs> that you recorded uh, the story, and I would like to watch it uh, uh, during daytime. <laughs> We'll try. We'll try and get it to you. But more, we'll have to see what we can do with that. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Yeah, we'll talk. About, uh, Morris and I will talk about that. Thank you, um, everybody. You guys are great, by the way. Fantastic. Fantastic. Good night, everybody. Hey, Morris. Yes. I was curious. Um, you know, I keep signing up for these and then I end up getting uh, interrupted by, by putting kids to bed. Do you guys record all of these and is there access to them for members? No, we don't put them back up. But presently, we don't have okay. like the signatures to do it or we have sure. that capability. It's another level of, of stuff we haven't talked about because <laughs> it's the, the speakers know that it isn't going to be repeated so sure. they get to have um exclusive rights to how would you say we don't want to dilute them because they'll <laughs> probably go do the program again somewhere else yeah that's fair okay that's fair enough but one day who knows yeah <laughs> or, or the idea to me would be if everybody clamored enough we bring them back and we get part two yeah very interesting that that's the and maybe not even part two, but it'd be a longer, shorter, or more polished, or more informative, but it'd be the same topic and just a different way, like all the different ways we talk about Sutter. <laughs> it'd be the same thing. That's my hopes. Yeah, fair enough. All right, well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Christina probably fell asleep. Yeah, Christina ran away. This is what I usually do. I come back and go, did everybody leave yet? Yep. 